Welcome back. Today, we're, we're going to continue our conversations about schools. Um, we, we, over the last few weeks or so, we've been talking about various issues in, in schools. And um, today, we're going we're gonna to continue that conversation and uh, talk about a few more things because, because schools, are, schools are a mess right now. Um, yeah, you know, I was out last night. It's um, December and uh, did a little bit of shopping last night. Ran into a, a teacher who's working in a store. She um, knows the woman who owns the store. She's working there, but she's a teacher, a full-time teacher. And every teacher I talk to, it seems like every teacher I talk to is, is just up to, their, up to their eyeballs and they're frustrated and a little bit of anger and a lot of frustration. They're kind of all at their wits end. And no matter where we look at education today, we see this, um, this boiling cauldron of anxiety and fear and, and anger and frustration. Yeah. And um, I thought, you know, we hate to go back and, and redo the topic, but it, it seems like a topic worth discussing, mainly because only people who are on the front lines in education really, really are aware that all this is happening. Um, you have to be a teacher or a bus driver or a cafeteria worker or a janitor to know what's uh, how how difficult um, education has become. Teaching uh, education, schooling children has become, and and most people aren't aware of it. They, there's this assumption that schools are back to normal, you know, because kids have returned to school buildings. That school has somehow somehow returned to normal, and nothing could be further from the truth. Right. Yeah. And I think that it's easy to to point to certain things and say, well, you know, it's COVID's fault or it's this fault or it's that fault. Um, but, you know, back in back in the 1960s, the there was a pediatrician in England who wrote this um, fantastic article that you, you and I reference often, especially one of our, it's one of our favorites. Right? It, is. Yeah, it really is. And, and it was a, a, a paper um, about six children with coughs. Um, mm -hmm. And basically what he was saying is that, you know, you, you can have six kids come into his office, he could have six kids come into his office, all of them with the, with the same presentation, um, all yeah. of them with coughs, but, but yeah. each of them could have a different, there, there's a different reason for their cough. Um, the diagnosis would be different. Um, the symptom is the same, but the diagnosis, what's causing the symptom is different. Um, and, and we use it quite often um, in, in a variety of contexts, because we, we've talked about it uh, before, uh, you know, six students um, who refuse school, um, six students who aren't doing their homework, um, you know, because th there's this common symptom, but there's a lot of different reasons for why the student um, isn't doing their homework. And we, we tend to go to, uh, we tend to have these sort of go-to um, uh, rationales for mm -hmm. why there's why we see some of these problems and we're going to just kind of we're, we're just trying to encourage people to have this idea that or keep in mind that the 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 common rationale that we're using um, and that we're considering for why schools are having such a difficult time maybe isn't mm -hmm. really the cause um, the cause I think is much more complex that's right yeah I think that you're right medicine is the easiest metaphor to use, whether it's, we talk about six children with cops, well, you could do the same thing with six children with fever. You right. know, there, there are many reasons why kids, nobody ever died of a fever, but there, uh, fever is a symptom right. that something is wrong. Right. And so, um, you know, you could have a fever related to teething. Kids will get a, they'll spike a fever when they're teething, or they get a, a little bit of a cold or an ear infection, they get a little bit of a fever. So in that case, the fever is doing its job of killing whatever's, uh, whatever's coming into your body. That's why you elevate temperature is to kill bacteria. Um, but sometimes a fever can be the sign or a symptom of a life-threatening condition. And you really need to know the difference. Right. I mean, like, we expect doctors to look at these symptoms, but then what is the cause? What am I dealing with? What's the appropriate intervention? Well, we feel the same way about uh, behavior in school children, because today we're hearing a lot about behavior of school children, especially young school children, yeah. um, pre-K and kindergarten and first graders who are really struggling. And you have to go, but that's just a behavior um, it, and a behavior is just a symptom right. that something else might be going wrong, okay? Right. Um, so 
we're going to talk a little bit about the behavior of school children in the context of the pandemic. Right. You know, what are we what are we dealing with and how do we manage this? Because part of what teachers are struggling with right now is the behavioral check, not just misbehavior, but, right. but the behavior that kids are bringing to school. When we're not just talking about misbehavior, we're, right. we're talking about all the behaviors that they're bringing to school because it has changed the landscape of the classroom. It, it, it has really dramatically changed the landscape of the classroom. And both teachers and students are struggling to manage these new classrooms. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we think about challenging behavior. And, and for anyone who's listening who works in education, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're dealing every day with students with, with challenging behaviors. Um, it, it's just what we do. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, I have I work at a couple of elementary schools and a middle school as my, my primary um, assignments. Mm -hmm. And every day, every day I'm in classrooms, every day I'm working individually with students or in groups of students or in the cafeteria or wherever, working with students who are presenting or who are being sent to different places because of behavior. And the, the one of the things we, we have to keep in mind is that, and I certainly notice this every day at work, is that um, it's the same kids. You know, it's, there's only about 5% of the kids who really account for most of the behavior problems that we have. Right. Um, you know, you can talk to anyone in, in the school, um, especially in the, in the main office, and you can go by grade level and you can identify a handful of students at each grade level that are really the, the, the ones that are the, the, the repeat um, visitors to the office. Um, so we're talking about a pretty, uh, a relatively finite number of students the challenge is that they, they exhaust everybody else and they exhaust the resources. Right. And, and sometimes they incite behavior from others who wouldn't otherwise engage in that behavior. That's right. And, and they become disruptive right. you know, to, to the educational process. And that's, that's another huge issue right now is that the 5% the of kids absorb about 60% of the school's resources. Right. It, it's these kids who are these repeat uh, visitors, as you call them. I, I don't like to call them repeat offenders. They're not committing crimes, m most of them, um, but, they, but, they, but they are asked to leave the classroom and go to the office. And, but they go to the office, and that doesn't solve the problem. It creates a problem. You just move the problem to another location. Right. In this case, it's, it's to the office, and then somebody has to use that day to manage this kid. And so um, you have this very small number of kids who are creating the, the most of the disruption to the educational process, and they're absorbing large amounts of the um, of the resources of the school. Okay, Absolutely. and this has all been made work, but we've always dealt with this. I right. mean, this is something that schools have been dealing with for for generations. Um, we know that it's getting worse um, over the over the last 20, 10 to twenty years. We know that um, the behavior problems have become more serious. The disruptions are more frequent. Um, so we know the things, and then the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic brought this all under a brighter light, but it also made everything worse. Right. So instead of having 5% of students, you might have 10% of students or 20% of students. And then you have those other students who wouldn't have caused problems who are also struggling because of the pandemic. So right. you've, the pandemic has exacerbated the problem that already the, the, that already existed that we were already struggling with. Right, A absolutely. And so, you know, one of the first um, articles that we're gonna talk about comes from um, Stuart Ab Ablon. Ablon? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ablon. Mm -hmm. Ablon. Um, and, and he talks about how, you know, schools are in crisis and, and student behavior is out of control. Um, and, you know, we really like this guy because um, some of the work that he's done with right. with with like Ross Green and looking at the collaborative problem solving model um, it is an approach that we use often when we are working with schools and and different and parents even um, but working with different folks to to help address right. student behavior. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a psychologist at Harvard. He's a 
big mm -hmm. and endowed chair and everything at Harvard. And, and he worked, he's a co-author with Ross Green and most people will recognize Ross Green. He wrote a book called The Explosive Child with uh, Stuart Ablin, or wrote a second book with Stuart Ablin, who's the co-author. Um, but so when, when Ablin speaks, people listen. He's like E.F. Hutton. This guy knows what's going on in schools. He lives in Massachusetts and Massachusetts has a pretty good school system. It's one of the best, considered one of the best school systems in the country. And this article, when I when when we encountered this article, it, the title was "SOS: Our Schools Are in Crisis, and We Need to Act Now." And um, so I thought, well, if Ablin is talking about this, it's probably worth listening to what he's saying. So we posted the whole article. We're going to kind of summarize the points that he's making, um, but we have a we have a place where you can uh, a website you can go to to see right. the whole article. So yeah. we're still. The point, the first point that he makes is um, as challenging as this, as education has been since 2020. Mm -hmm. So we had the end of 2020 school year, all of 2020, 2021, and we're into 21, 22. And he said, the pandemic is not over for education. All of the ill effects mm -hmm. that the pandemic brought in 2020 are still very much with us. Yeah. And you see it every day. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's, um, you know, behavior continues to escalate, you know, some of the some of the schools, I, I, I try to monitor uh, behavior as closely as I can in my schools. And, you know, the number just the number of referrals uh, to the office are, you know, are they are they increasing? Uh, oh, out of this world. Um, oh, okay. mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was at a, um, I was visiting a, a high school recently, and I, I looked at their referrals and um, and it said, uh, I got the little note that says only showing the, the most recent thousand, <laughs> most recent 1,000 referrals. And we're not even through the first semester yet. You're uh, kidding. Over 1,000 students. Over 1,000 referrals to the office. Yeah. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. You know, almost daily at, at some of my schools, um, you know, students are being suspended. And um, for, for a variety uh, of behaviors. And, you know, again, you get the idea that, Okay, we gotta we gotta kind of clamp down, and we gotta uh, you know really right. get get strict. But but then at the same time, you know, we're losing a lot of instructional time. We're losing a lot of the time that we we're dealing with the problems that we're talking about having. So you know we have escalating behavior. Classrooms are out of control, um, and we've talked you know last week about you know how teachers are exhausted, and you know right. they're just you know they're they're leaving the field. Um, it's 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 overwhelming, right? Right, and then and so, and the point that he continues to make is that basic expectations. What we all think about what happens in a third grade curriculum, or what happens? What are you supposed to learn as a first grader? What are you supposed to learn as a fifth grader? Those basic expectations are not being met. Right. I mean, we're we're not. I mean, you used the phrase the other day. These these kids have holes in their academic background. Stuff that they were supposed to learn. Mm -hmm. They were home during the quarantine or the classroom was too chaotic or for whatever reason, these kids have, have gaps in their academic background right. because, and base, because we're not, you, you can't possibly teach the same curriculum during a pandemic that you taught prior to the pandemic. Right. It just won't. So these basic expectations are not being met. And so what, what he taught, what he does then is he, he gives a bunch of teacher comments, which, which really are alarming. When you hear the teachers talk about what it's like, it really is alarming. And, and you kind of forget this stuff. If you're not teaching, if you're not in a classroom, you sort of forget these things. Absolutely. But it's worth mentioning. Absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things that we talk about, again, talk about often on the podcast is the, the, the importance of socialization, right? right. Um, you know, attending school requires a certain set of skills. Right. Um, we hope students have it coming in in kindergarten, but many of them don't. Um, right. if they don't. We have a couple of years, according to the research, we have a couple of years to get a, get them socialized right. mm -hmm. um, before before we start to have serious concerns. And and socialized basically means they know how to take instruction from other people. They know how to. Um, interact and engage with other people in appropriate ways. They're not biting people. They're not hitting and you know, those kinds of things. Well, 
um, one of the things that the teachers are saying is that students just don't know how to do school anymore. That's they don't right. know how to interact with others and they just don't know how to do school. And it, it is a very fundamental thing that I think, again, is one of those, um, you know, one of the causes of the cough or causes of the fever that we don't really pay attention to because yeah. we just assume that that system is in place. And right. it's such a foundational, fundamental um, mm -hmm. skill that many times we don't even look at it. Right. Yeah, my grandson is caught. He, he was um, in pre-K when school shut down, so it really didn't matter. But kindergarten was online. Right. And he, he had a really, I mean, that was his introduction to school. Sure. Was, was online. He couldn't do that. He didn't know how to use the devices. He didn't know the programs. And his dad, and I finally, you know, his dad would call me all frustrated because they couldn't get him to sit for that many hours uh, a day. And I said, just forget about it. So now he's in first grade and he's, he's introduced to school for the first time as right. a first grader. Okay. Now he's, I think uh, it, it looks like he's doing okay, but he has the advantage of parents who keep up with this stuff and his dad is able to spend time with him, but um, not, a, not all kids have that. But here he is in first grade, just beginning his schooling. Right. And, and it's, um, you, you know, the, the older students get, and, and this is, I think it's, I'm, I find it very difficult as I work it in my, my mind to, to ex explain this, but um, the older students get when, and they are, when trying to learn more fundamental skills, Mm -hmm. the more difficult it is to learn those skills. Right, that's you know, right. Um, you know, you can take a foreign language, for example. Um, if you take a language that you've never learned before, mm -hmm. um, if you're in an elementary school, you can pick up that language relatively well. It's, it's relatively easy to pick up the language. Right. Um, and we see that with, with elementary school and middle school students who, you know, watch anime and they, they all this, you know, they learn Japanese, you know, mm -hmm. they, they know enough Japanese to where they could, they've heard it enough. <laughs> um, we could watch hours and hours and hours of anime and never pick up on the Japanese words, you know. Um, I can assure you. <laughs> because as we get older, it's more difficult to learn some of those fundamental skills. And so he's in first grade attempting to learn the, the socialization mm -hmm. and schooling skills that he needed to learn last year. And the, and the first thing he had to learn how to do was to go to school. Right. As a first grader, now that, that was the first adjustment that he had to make. And he has idea, I mean, he's a pretty active kid. And I, I didn't know whether he was gonna be able to make that adjustment right. to how he's supposed to behave in school. Right. Fortunately, he made it, it took him a couple months. But, but that's the first thing he had to do. There wasn't a lot of learning going on in those months. Right, because think about, you know, in, in his kindergarten year, going to school mm -hmm. was putting on a shirt and sitting in front of a computer. Exactly. Now he's got to get dressed in a uniform. He's got to have his backpack packed. He, gotta, he has to make sure he has lunch money or has a lunch packed. And he has to get in the car and he has to go somewhere. Um, and he had to stay awake all day long with no right. breaks. Right. But right at home, he could take breaks and take a nap and go to sleep and do whatever he wanted to do. In his pajamas all day. Right. Now right. he has, you're right. So mm -hmm. students don't know how to do school anymore. And, and right. same thing in middle school and, and high school. We're seeing the same, the same phenomenon. So it's, right. um, you know, being able to do school, being able to last the entire school day, um, you know, that's <laughs> really difficult to do. You know, if you remember during the pandemic, kids were playing video games. They would go take naps in the middle of the day. Okay? Right. All of a sudden, they have to they have to rebuild their stamina to to stand for six or seven or eight hour school day right. if they don't have a long bus ride. Right. Okay? Some of these kids are at it for 10 hours a day between bus rides and school. Um, so first of all, they don't know how to do school. That was the case with my grandson. Second, they don't have the stamina. Third, kids are below grade level. I mean, most kids are below working below grade level, but teachers still have the pressure to teach that grade's curriculum. Right. So let's say a kid was in third grade last year, didn't learn the multiplication tables. They're not going to reteach those in fourth grade. Right. The fourth grade teacher is going to do the fourth grade curriculum. That kid just isn't going to learn the multiplication tables unless he learned them at home. Right. And so okay. you have those academic gaps, but then you also have social gaps. You know, students... Mm -hmm 
have forgotten how to interact with other people because everything has been virtual. They're, you know, everything was virtual for a year almost. That's right. Um, right. So they don't have social skills for interacting with each other and they don't have the social skills for how to interact at school. Right, um, right. And, and so all of this breeds sort of an underlying frustration or anger in kids um, that, you know, they're, they don't have the social skills, they don't have the stamina, they don't have the basic academic skills. And so they're more apt to act out. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're acting out. And this is the point I think that, that Ablin wants to make is that we're seeing all these behaviors, but we have to try to figure out what's causing, what has caused this change. Right. Yeah. I, I think, and one of the things that we're doing, I think is um, we're, we're oftentimes resorting to um, the need for special education. You know, you, we were talking about this sort of in the, uh, in preparation for the podcast, um, you know, more and more kids keep getting referred or parents are calling and saying that they want, you know, their kid to have an IEP or something. But, you know, I, I, I find myself really pushing against that because, right. you know, a kid isn't going to all of a sudden have a, a learning disability in, in sixth grade. Um, you know, a, a student isn't going to all of a sudden um, be diagnosed with autism um, in, in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen. Um, right. You know, they're socially awkward. Perhaps they're socially awkward because they just spent a year and a half um, in, in, in a very strange situation, uh, right. in a non-social type situation. Um, right. But so there's lots of other potential reasons for these behaviors and what we're seeing, some of these difficulties, but we're we're only we're sort of keeping this narrow focus on what the potential remedies are. That's right. So when for Abba, this this notion that of kids um, acting out, what he summarizes, I think he summarizes it very nicely with this phrase. He said, "Challenging behavior happens in the gap." between demands placed upon someone and their skills to handle those demands. Right. And I think that captures nicely what we're dealing with in school, the demands on students and the demands on teachers. And we, we now have expectations that neither is able to meet. And when that happens, that's when challenging behaviors fill that gap between right. what's expected and what's possible. Right, because we are continuing to put place demands on students mm -hmm. um and and it and in fact many times our demands haven't changed at all despite the pandemic and despite what's been happening what what has happened over the past year and a half almost two years now <laughs> yeah nobody's changed nobody's changed the grade level curriculum right it, that's all I mean, the still time. still there right mm -hmm. and the expectation is that the teachers are going to work through it at the same pace that they typically would mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know for the most part and so you know, those academic demands are, and, and behavioral demands are still placed upon and expected of the students, um, but they just, they just don't have those skills. That's right. Since the pandemic, students didn't progress either academically or socially as they would have normally, okay? So most students are behind academically, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really going to be very difficult or impossible for them to meet the next grade level uh, expectations. I mean, right. you missed a lot of school in third grade and now you're in fourth grade and you're, and that's what Ablin's talking about. He said, now you have an expectation that they'll do the fourth grade curriculum, but they don't have all of the skills from third grade to do right. fourth grade, okay? But he says the same thing about social skills. So I think the important point here is kids not only behind academically, they're also behind socially because they missed all those important social interactions that they would have gotten during the 2021 school year. Right. And it's the same thing for the teachers. You know, the, the expectations on them, you know, pretty much are back to what they were before the pandemic. That's right. Um, if you're a fourth grade teacher, go teach your fourth grade curriculum. Right. And, and it's, um, you know, the demands, the teachers have the, those same foundational skills that you know, we expect the students to have, we expect the teachers to have those and it's new and different for them as well. Um, and then at the same time, they're dealing, they're responsible for the students 
who don't have the skills to do. So it's like, there's a double whammy for the teachers right. because mm -hmm. they're struggling personally. And then they're having to, uh, they have to be responsible for the students who are struggling personally. Right, that's right, yep. And, and so you can imagine a teacher who is dealing, all of a sudden dealing with kids who are behind academically, they're behind socially, they don't know how to behave in school anymore. They don't have the stamina for school. And yet everybody from the department, from the State Department of Education down to parents, everybody is expecting that teacher to accomplish the fourth grade curriculum or right. the fifth grade curriculum or the, or the middle school curriculum. Right. The expectation is still there while this cauldron mm -hmm. of, of problems is, is, uh, is rolling around them, is boiling out of control, and they're expected uh, business as usual. Let's go back and pick up where we left off. Right. Um, and teachers are feeling that pressure. So we have unreasonable demands on students, and we have unreasonable demands on teachers. And so he's okay, so given this situation, the kids are behind academically, they're behind socially, they're beginning to act out because of the unreasonable expectations. He said, what can we do? Yeah, yeah. and, and, and there, there's really, um, as he presents it, one of two things that we can do, um, right. one of two levers that we can pull. The first is to, we, we can either reduce expectations or we can rebuild skills. Right. Um, and again, both of them address most of the issues that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, because either we're going to, as he said, challenging behaviors happen in the gap between expectations and the kid's skills to, or the person's skills to, to meet those right. expectations. Um, so if we lower the expectations, we reduce that gap. And so make the gap smaller, right? Right. Or we can rebuild skills. We can get the student up to where the expectations are. Right. Still Getting don't... them up there. <laughs> that takes a lot of time. That's right, right. Yeah, that gap is gonna persist. Right. When you talk about building skills, it's gonna take a long time, months to years to rebuild right. those skills. In the meantime, the gap stays pretty large. Because and the so, expectations are gonna keep going up. And so we have to build skills at a rate faster than the expectations increase. Right, right, which we can't do right. because when the kid goes to the next grade level, the expectations here again, okay? Yeah. And so, okay, you can build those skills, but then the expectations increase. And in today's culture, where we see this playing out in, in, in catastrophic ways is in kindergarten classes. Because right. in the past few years, as everybody knows, the kindergarten curriculum has really expanded so that it's really the first grade curriculum. Right. We've moved first grade to kindergarten. And so that's where we see this playing out, this gap between the expectation and the skills is widest in kindergarten. And guess where we're having most of our behavior problems? Right. In kindergarten. Okay. Yeah. There's no, there's no mystery about that. The expectation has risen, it's been pushed up, and the skills are lower because kids haven't been in school. Right. And that's where the behavior problems are at their worst. Yeah. Yeah. Th there's another article yeah. that, that we'll put this put in the show notes um, that talks about pre-K, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and it talks about the need for, um, you know, um, research-based, evidence-based uh, preschool curriculum. Um, right. You know, the, the, a preschool curriculum should consist of one thing. Let's socialize the kids. Yes. Get used to going to school. Get, learn how to go to school. Right. Um, right. You know, this, this idea, and, and, you know, if they learn their colors, that's fantastic. If they learn their alphabet, that's, that's amazing. Um, but the primary goal needs to be, let's socialize them. Let's get them right. accustomed to being in a classroom with, you know, five or 10 or, or more other students. Um, let's right. get them accustomed to taking direction from other adults that's not a parent. Um, and let's get them used to a routine um, that, mm -hmm. that is sort of bookended by uh, bells, <laughs> you know, right. the, the, the school bell. Um, that's it. Um, but, you know, when we when we start to have these expectations that students are going to, you know, you know, four year olds, um, four and five year olds are going to gain these huge academic skills mm -hmm. and go to kindergarten with those skills so that then right. they can be built up. It, it, again, it's no wonder that we have these young these younger kids in their you know, primary uh, years of school who are so who are struggling so much because they don't have any of that. 
That's right. All That's of right. That interrupted. And if we could tell every kindergarten teacher in the country, it's not you. <laughs> right. You're, you're being asked to do an impossible task because in, even before the pandemic, the expectation was higher than the ability of the student. The gap was too wide and that's filled in by misbehavior. Right. It, it, it's inevitable, okay? Right. And, and it's not anything that you're doing wrong. It's just an, it, it truly is an impossible task. Right. So, so because it takes so long to build the skills, really at this point in, in the short term, the really, mm -hmm. the focus has to be on managing our expectations. Right. Um, right. That's something that can that can change very quickly, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it needs to be done well. It needs to be done appropriately, but right. it can be done pretty quickly, um, mm -hmm. so that we're matching what our expectations are with what the students are able to do, and right. as well as what's developmentally appropriate, and, and so on. That's right, and we know that schools are are going to be very concerned about reducing the expectation. I mean, how do you? How do you say to a, a large school district or a state department of education, hey, look, this kindergarten curriculum isn't working. We have to reduce. Let's just reduce the expectation. Let's just take preschool. Let's do pre-K and kindergarten. Right. You don't have to reduce the curriculum at every grade level. Let's just reduce the curriculum at pre-K and kindergarten. Let's, let's teach kids how to go to school. Right. in those two years at four and eight and age five. Let's teach them how to go to school so that when they get to first grade, at least that has been accomplished. And we reduce that gap. So you reduce the behavior problems that are really, really creating huge problems. I mean, we, you talk to school districts uh, around the country and every time you do a talk in any state, every, every audience says the same thing. Most of our problems, most our worst behavior problems are in kindergarten and first grade. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think Ablin's absolutely right. And I think that given the crisis that we're in, that we know we're in, um, let's do what we can. Some things we can do immediately and some things are more long-term, but immediately I think we ought to have some serious discussions about reducing expectations, at least for kindergarten kids. Right. Yeah, we, okay. we can't, um, you know, in, in it sort of ideally, um, in this utopian idealized world, mm -hmm. um, we would we would have all the students just sort of hit repeat and just kind of let's go let's go back to the beginning of last year um, right. and, and let's do it again, um, right. repeat right. it here um, so that we can go through it again and get those skills and make sure we fill in all those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously we can't do that because of tons of logistic reasons. Um, mm -hmm. In, in, in social emotional reasons even, mm -hmm. um, but that would be that would be ideal. We can't right. do that, but we but we ha so we have to again kind of pull back some of those expectations and and some of the demands that we're placing on them and let them rebuild those skills and and right. rebuild that that stamina to be able to manage the things we need right. to manage. That's right. And why do we pick on kindergarten? Well, even before the pandemic, and this is what that second article you mentioned is about. Even before the pandemic. Um, teachers, kindergarten teachers, and this was happened to be in Massachusetts, which, as, as I said earlier, has one of the premier uh, educational systems in the country, uh, is in Massachusetts. And kindergarten teachers, um, even in 2019, were voicing their concerns. They were really protesting against this curriculum being raised um, and making first uh, kindergarten students uh, do things that they weren't developmentally um, able to do. And in the article, Peter Gray uh, talks about child, he refers to it as child abuse. I mean, the, the teachers refer to it as child abuse, making kids do things that they're not developmentally ready to do. Right. You know, and it's so funny because, um, and we've talked about this before as well, but, you know, one of the best, the, the places where the, they have some of the strongest, um, best educational outcomes um, <clears throat> in the world is Finland, right? Right, that's right. Kids don't go to school <laughs> in pre-K. Kids and, and kids aren't right. learning to read and write and do all that kind of stuff until much later. Right, uh, than they into the early school. elementary grades. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those first, that's their model is those first few years, the, the school days are short and, and it is all about socializing. 
Get, so how do you do school? You, you need to learn how to do school, get along with other kids, get along with the teacher. You have to learn how to manage school, right? Yeah. And so we've taken that away because by dropping this heavy academic expectation on kindergarten kids, we've taken away the opportunity for them to learn how to do school. And right. we've created that gap. Okay? Right, absolutely. So that's what teachers were rebelling against. They were rebelling against um, being forced to, to, um, to force their students to meet these expectations, which they knew were unreasonable. But the problem is the teachers were the ones seeing the children get angry and anxious and misbehave and cry because they couldn't do what they were expected to do. And there's a, he gave, makes a wonderful quote and it is kind of heartbreaking when you think about it, but this is a quote from a teacher. And if it's okay, I'd, I'd just like to read this because it, it sort of brings everything into focus. And this teacher said, I've taught kindergarten for 25 years. Last week, I gave my five-year-olds a reading assignment, five-year-olds reading assignment, that required them to infer the meaning of bifocals after hearing a five paragraph story about Benjamin Franklin. This is the kind of madness that permeates the curriculum designed for kindergarten. And she, she goes on to say, I'm retiring earlier than I had planned because I just can't be part of this any longer. Right. And that is a teacher, that's a valuable resource. She's taught for 25 years. Mm -hmm. She's probably a kind hearted, loving, considerate, um, experienced teacher who's going to leave the profession because she knows what she's being asked to do is wrong. It's developmentally inappropriate. Right. I, and I know of teachers here in our school mm -hmm. district who are more or less doing the same thing. They're leaving because, oh. you know, they're, they're seeing how students are struggling and they've said, you know, mm -hmm. they just can't continue to, to worry about and, and try to, you know, press kids to learn some of these things that they're having to, that they have to learn in school when they, they have all these other, so many other struggles and so many other right. issues going on in their lives. So, right. but, you know, I, I think that sort of an important point for us to, 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 to mention before we wrap up today is that we know that it is really difficult to lower expectations on a systemic level, you know, right. schools, right. Schools are not that flexible um, mm -hmm. as, as much as we would like for them to be. They are not that flexible. They, um, you know, they have rules and regulations and, you know, and those come down from, you know, higher ups. They, they come down That's from right. the capital. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we don't have, there's not a lot of decisions and a lot of choices as it relates to some of those issues. And, and so we recognize that that's a, that's a challenge. Right. But it wasn't, and, and I'm going to be probably a little bolder than, I, than we normally are. It's not the teachers, it's not the kindergarten teachers who designed or asked for this right. curriculum. It wasn't their idea. This came from a department of education hundreds of miles away who have no idea what it's like to teach in a kindergarten. And I don't, they don't, they don't see the kids struggling. They don't see the behavior problems. They don't see the anxiety. They don't see the, the, the temper tantrums because they're in very clean air conditioned offices in a state capital somewhere. And so these regulations and rules and, and requirements and expectations are handed down to teachers and teachers are told to make the most of it. Right. Well, now we have a situation brought into stark relief by the pandemic where we once again acknowledge that what we're asking kindergarten kids to do is developmentally inappropriate, especially boys. Right. Okay, some girls, some boys can do it, but but most kids that age mm -hmm. are not going to be readers or thinkers who can handle that that kind of expectation. And again, we go back to what Ablin said: if the expectation is too high, it's the gap is going to be filled with behavior problems. Right. What what Bernie, Bernie and I know this happens to you all the time. We're asked, "What should we do about the behavior problems? How should we deal with these kids who are misbehaving in kindergarten?" Right. Well, yeah. First of all, you shouldn't have too many misbehaving. 
The well, reason you have it is because of the gap. Right. And, and it's not I because think, of the kids. Right. And I think that, um, you know, again, we can go back to the, the six kids with coughs. Um, it, some of these kids are having a pro- hard time because they don't, they're not socialized. Other kids are having a hard time because they don't have the academic foundational skills. Some of these kids, and, and this is the one that breaks your heart, you know, some of these kids are struggling because they're living in a homeless shelter. <laughs> And it's like, you know, you, you have all these, and, and all three of those kids are in the same classroom. And they're expected to infer what bifocals mean. Right. And so it's, it's, it's so challenging. And, and, um, and I think that for some of these reasons, answering that question, you know, what, am I, what do I do about my students who aren't doing, you know, aren't behaving, aren't, aren't following the rules, is even challenging for dealing with, with kindergarten because you're not going to reason with a kindergartner and say look you know you need this for graduation (laughs) you're you're not going to you're not going to do that with a a kindergartner will just sit there and say no Mm -hmm. right and what do you you can call their parent Mm -hmm. you can take away their ipad which is just going to make them more angry you can you can take away their their free their recess which is only going to make away recess silent lunch right by themselves you can do all of these things it's not going to change the behavior it's not going to change their foundational skills to help them do what you need them to do. Right. That's right. And again, their misbehavior is simply a symptom that something is wrong. Right. But we have to look beyond something wrong with the child. Right. There's something wrong somewhere. Right. And it's our obligation to figure out where it is. And right. I would challenge, I would start by challenging departments of education to say, hey, let's ease up a little right. bit. Because the problem is not with the kids and the right. problem is not with ineffective teachers. Right. The problem is the system. There's something in the system that's making people sick. You right. know, it's like um, that famous story of, of the diphtheria epidemic where the cause of the problem was that the water coming out of the pump was contaminated. Right. And once they shut off the pump, the, diseases, um, the, the disease incident went down because the problem was not the problem was the, the source of the problem is the water. Right. Okay. And we have to do the same thing here. What is the source of this problem? Right. Yeah. I think that the, the, the most important thing that we can do, you know, systemically um, in education, like it, that the only thing that a school can do, um, you know, if we get down to right. real specific mm-hmm. is, is I think focusing on social emotional learning, right. um, teaching kids from day one from kindergarten day one you know how do i deal with my emotions how do i deal with these feelings that i have how do i deal with frustration when i don't know how to do something and i'm being expected to do it right. how do i handle that um because if you can teach that skill and they the students have a firm grasp on strategies for coping with those mm-hmm. issues mm-hmm. then we can then you know when they arrive at a place where they're struggling and they're having a hard time then we can, we can see that and we can communicate that we're not dealing with the behavior challenge. They know how to deal with that frustration. They may not have to know how to deal with those academic expectations. There may still be a gap there, but they know they have the skill to deal with that gap um, from a social emotional perspective. That's right. And then we can build the skill. We don't have to, we're not responding to behavior. We can respond to the skill deficit. That's right. Because what's happening, what's happening in school, what teachers are frustrated with today is they're spending more time dealing with these behavioral, um, the behaviors, and they're taking away from instructional time. So okay? they're losing even more. Right. So you lose even more. Right. But it, right. So yeah. again, the idea with this six children with fevers is you have to figure out what's happening at the level of the system. And then you also have to figure out why is this particular child right. having a struggle? What, it, what, it, what skills does this child not possess? And as you say, it could be that the child's homeless. It right. could be that they're living in a chaotic, dangerous household. It right. may be that uh, some, you know, they've lost a relative, a grandfather, or even a parent uh, right. to the disease. And so we, we have to stop for a moment and figure out what's happening at a systems level, what's happening at the individual level. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then and then hopefully we can start gaining some traction and get back right to regain. I talked to a principal 
and, and she was more than a principal, it was a high level, uh, upper level administrator. And she said, schools will never be the same right. after the pandemic. This is, right. we, we're, schools will now be a bit different. Right. For, we're never going to go back to pre pandemic education. Absolutely. So we, we have to learn how to redo this. Yes. Okay. So, okay. okay. Well, I, I think that's it for today. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll uh, we'll get back at some uh, other topics next week. It's holiday time. We're probably going to talk a little bit about managing family members. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Recalcitrant family members that we're going to encounter. Yes. Sir. Over the holidays and then New Year's resolutions. Yes. Next couple of weeks, we're we're winding down. It's speeding. It's speeding toward us, as Miss Cassie would say. Thirteen days left. Thirteen. All right. And then it's here. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.